Okay. All right, come on back, everyone. It's good that you're snacking right now, because as you'll see, this is a very appropriate time of the day to be eating per our circadian rhythm. So bring your snacks in with you, and we'll get started. Since I submitted my bio, I actually finished my second master's degree. I have an MSN as of six weeks ago, so this is my first presentation with two masters. And I'm like, that looks kind of ridiculous, but also I'm really proud, and I promised my husband I would wait at least two years before I considered another degree. So we'll see. So I have no financial disclosures. I was on the Oregon Nutrition Advisory Board. I ended my term 22 months ago, and the form says anything in the last 24 months. So that's done. My personal disclosure is in my nursing job, I work night shift. So not only do I have a personal interest in this topic, I also came off of the weekend of working night shift yesterday morning and then flew here. I slept last night, but when I made these slides, I was on a day shift brain. I'm split between days and nights. And today I'm in like a somewhere in between kind of tired brain. <laughs> so if at any point I look at my slide for a moment and think, what was I gonna tell them about this? Just give me a little bit of grace. So my objectives for you today, we're gonna to talk about the impact of circadian misalignment on metabolic health. We'll evaluate the research on meal timing as it relates to circadian rhythm. And I'm going to propose some strategies for what we can do to support our patients who have distorted meal timing patterns. So as we get started in talking about circadian misalignment, we first have to talk about what is normal circadian rhythm. And I'm sure everyone's somewhat familiar with this concept, but if you've ever geeked out on it, it's fascinating how our bodies are aligned to the daylight and so many different you know, biomechanisms are taking place at every hour of the day and night. So basically, our master clock in our brain is aligned to daylight. And based on the day and, and lack of day rhythms, we have cortisol secretion that starts around 6 a.m. that cuts off our melatonin, so we start waking up. Our insulin secretion is supposed to be timed out with our first meal around 7 to 8 a.m. We have our best alertness at 10 a.m., so yay, we're in the 10 o'clock hour, everyone's awake. Around 5 p.m. is actually when we're at our strongest, so that's if you're you know, a workout person, that's actually a, a great time to be exercising. It doesn't really fit into everyone's schedule at that time. There's a couple of things on this slide. This slide was focused on cancer, so you see some things about neutrophils and lymphocytes. But around 9 p.m., our bodies begin to secrete melatonin, and that's gonna wind us down for nighttime. And our deepest sleep usually occurs between about 2 to 4 a.m. You really want to be sleeping at that time. That's when there's other things happening in your body. And I mentioned our master clock. So our master clock, it's the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN is the nickname, that lives in our brain. That is our primary circadian clock. And that is the one that's cued by light. But we don't just have one in our brain, we have peripheral clocks in every single organ, and even within our cells. So I'm focusing on meal timing today, so I'm gonna be talking about our digestive circadian rhythm. So we've got like rhythm in our liver, river, li rhythm in our stomach, a circadian clock in our intestines, and those are cued by when we're eating. And then even on the cellular level, We've got our gut hormones, our glucose transporters, our glucagon receptors. Those also have their own circadian clocks. So we've got clocks like everywhere in our body. And that's why, as we'll talk about today, when we're eating at a time that our master clock is not awake, that's what causes this misalignment. And what we know with circadian misalignment is it greatly increases our risk of all sorts of metabolic dysfunctions. There's different reasons that we might have circadian misalignment. We do this in studies with mice, so you have mutations in circadian clock genes. Eating at nighttime, does anyone eat at nighttime? Yeah, that has actually you know, causes circadian misalignment. We'll talk a lot about that. Night shift workers, who here works night shift currently? Who has worked, a couple of you, who has worked night shift in the past? Who has patients who work night shift? So like almost everyone in this room is going to be impacted this, by this in some way, especially when we're supporting ourselves and our patients. Exposure to light at night. 
It was just over a hundred years ago that we developed artificial light and light bulbs. So for many, 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 many years, we didn't have artificial light to be awake all night. We had like torches, and there's only so much you can do by firelight. So just in the past hundred years, we are now operating on a 24 hour clock and being able to do things all night long. And if you really want to deep dive, there's an entire field of study on chronobiology, not just for humans, but how animals, plants, bacteria, how everything in our universe is messed up because we now have artificial light and we have access to light all night long. That's not my talk today, but when I was digging into research, I was like, oh my gosh, like even plants, even plants are messed up because we have lights at night now. So what happens when we have this disrupted clock? We are at much greater risk of metabolic syndrome. Hypertension, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, or just having low HDL, um, abdominal obesity. Ultimately, we have an increased risk for obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases. And again, I've talked about this cellular level clock that we all have within our bodies. There are specifically articles here also on gut hormone clock. And this is what is fascinating if you love the gut like dietitians do, right? That our gut hormones are aligned to be working at certain times. So adiponectin, this hormone increases glucose use and insulin sensitivity. And that hormone is really functioning from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's when we have our, our best ability to use glucose and be sensitive to insulin. Ghrelin, our hunger hormone, that's set to go off at certain times of the day, starting around 8-ish, 1 p.m., the latest is 6 p.m. The FGF21, I wasn't really familiar with that gut hormone. I thought I knew them all. This gut hormone is secreted only in the middle of the night from about 4 a.m., well, I guess to early morning, 4 a.m. to around 8 or 9 a.m. This hormone is essential for fatty oxidization and glycolysis, so or glycolysis, so breaking down glycogen stores. And I have, I did know that growth hormone is secreted best around like 4 a.m. or so. This is related to growth hormone. And so there have been studies for years now showing that people who aren't able to sleep between that like 2 a.m. to 4, 5 a.m. period alone are at increased risk for obesity because that's when some of these hormones are doing their work. And then we talked about our melatonin, which is being secreted all night long to help us sleep. Leptin is the hormone that tells our brains that we have enough fat storage in our bodies. So leptin is working from about 4 p.m. to 2 a.m., and that should be turning off our hunger drive because that's telling our brain, hey, you've got enough storage in your bodies. You don't need to eat anything right now. We do know that some people with obesity are actually resistant to leptin. Their brain doesn't acknowledge that hormone telling them we have enough energy in the body. But also we know that for various reasons, we override all of these hormones all the time because we eat for many reasons besides what our gut hormones are telling us. And so one more slide here showing the circadian misalignment that occurs specifically related to these gut hormones as well. So when we are eating at times that our body really isn't designed to be eating, we have a decrease in our PYY. That's a hormone that should be reducing appetite. And when we shouldn't be eating, and I say shouldn't, obviously we have to eat at every hour for various reasons, but when our body's not primed to be eating, that PYY should be working. If we're eating in the middle of the night, that hormone goes down. It's not helping to reduce our appetite any longer. And leptin, that hormone that tells our brain, hey, you've got enough storage in your body, you don't really need to be eating, that's also reduced. And so there's research saying, well, how does this affect our appetite? We're still working this out. But there's some evidence saying that people tend to be hungrier then when they're already eating in the middle of the night, it makes you hungrier. And that could impact your energy intake or your food choices. We also know that people who are living in circadian misalignment in general, their body just burns less energy over the 24-hour period. And that's, again, probably because they're not able to sleep overnight when those other hormones are doing their work. So ultimately, just another study showing us when we look specifically at these hormones, 
that circadian misalignment can lead to a positive energy balance, which ultimately can lead to weight gain. So a few takeaways from our first part of the talk. We have several circadian clocks in our bodies, right? So we've got our main one in our brain, but our cells, our organs also have their own clocks, and our whole body is designed to function best with daylight. When we eat outside of our circadian rhythm, we create circadian misalignment. So it's not just being awake in the middle of the night, that's gonna mess up your brain's clock, but also eating in the middle of the night or eating late at night or eating at off times, that's going to set the circadian misalignment as well. So knowing what we know, what do we do with this? How can we minimize the negative outcomes or maybe maximize the positive outcomes? So my second part here is looking at meal timing research. And I've lumped these into two main categories. We have studies looking at time-restricted eating. So this is limiting the amount of hours that you have to eat. So maybe it's eating from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. We also have studies looking at macronutrient distribution. So our macronutrients, right, our proteins, our fat, our carbs, adjusting those based on our circadian alignment. So usually that's stacking more of those nutrients earlier in the day and tapering off later in the day. And then we actually have some studies that look at both, which is really cool to see that combined impact. So you're gonna see my acronyms, or my abbreviations of TRE and MD as we look at these different studies. And I also just want to clarify that time-restricted eating, this is one subset of intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting has been a buzz for several years now. And there's three main types of intermittent fasting. There's alternate day where I eat today, I don't eat tomorrow, I eat the following day, I don't eat the next day. So full days of eating or not eating. There's modified fasting, the most popular one is the 5-2. So five days out of the week I eat normally, two days out of the week I eat very, very, very little. I eat like 25% of my normal intake or some sort of decreased modification or maybe I eat nothing at all. And then finally, time-restricted eating this really is a form of intermittent fasting, and basically it's trying to extend that fasting that occurs overnight. So we're mostly talking about time-restricted eating, but this is still within the whole like umbrella of intermittent fasting. So here is a time-restricted eating study that was just published last year, and these were 14 free-living adults with type 2 diabetes. So free living is they're not in a laboratory during this study. They're at home, they're doing their daily routine, but they have very specific instructions as how to eat. And these studies are really nice because that better exemplifies what it's like for us. I'm gonna show you some studies where people lived in laboratories and every single thing is controlled. And that's pretty cool to see what's actually happening when all of your variables are controlled for in terms of external factors but that's never gonna be the case for anyone in their real life. So this was 14 adults, type two diabetes, free living. And they had two different interventions. One intervention was time-restricted eating. So they had to eat all of their food within a six hour window. So, or sorry, with, sorry, they ate all of their food in less than 10 hours. And so the 1800 hours shows the start of when they were fasting. And they did this for three weeks, so had to eat in under 10 hours. The other group was our control group, and they were eating for more than 14 hours. They could kind of eat whenever they wanted, but they had to at least have 14 hours between their breakfast and their dinner. And so each group followed their diet plan for three weeks, and then they did the crossover. So they like kind of did a washout period where everyone had a little break time and then did the other study. So the fasting people did non-fasting and vice versa. And they measured several things. So this like little thing with the fire and the mitochondria underneath, it's just symbolizing some of the blood tests that they did and their energy expenditure. But you can see here, I can't, uh, let me see if I can use this little part next to the person, this is showing you the main outcomes of what they found. So they found that this time-restricted eating didn't change someone's hepatic glycogen stores at all. There is no significant change there. It also didn't significantly change their insulin sensitivity. 
It did change their 24-hour glucose. During the fasting and control periods, there was a four-day window right in the middle of the three weeks where everyone wore CGMs. And so they had four days of CGM data from the middle of this study, or the middle of each intervention. And they found that the people who were having, on the time-restricted eating plan, eating all of their food in less than 10 hours, and had to stop eating by 6 p.m., those people had lower 24-hour glucose levels and they had an increased time in range. And so this study shows, again, I put a little caption at the top. So they had a decrease in their 24-hour glucose homeostasis, no changes to their insulin sensitivity or their hepatic glucose, but the, the graph on the left with that kind of dashed line, those are the control people who were eating more than 14 hours, whereas the solid black line, those were the time-restricted eating people. And so you can actually see when those time-restricted eating people were eating, because you can see those glucose peaks are right after they ate, and you can see that overnight, they had significantly lower glucose levels. And overall, they also had some periods where they dipped lower, other periods where they matched or even slightly higher than the control groups. And the graph on the right is showing you their time and range. So our control people are the white boxes, and the time-restricted eating people are the black boxes. And so in the normal range category, the time-restricted eating people had significantly difference in terms of a greater time and range, and they spent less time in a higher than normal range for their glucose. There was nothing significant with the other categories like hypoglycemia or low, lower range as well. This time-restricted eating study, this was just published this year, and I couldn't find any cool graphics in their paper to show. But what their thing was that they were really excited about is they did this for a whole year, free living adults, and they actually had a racially diverse population. So it's primarily black and non-black Hispanic patients. So they were able to show this not just in a group of white people, which a lot of the studies are mostly white people. All of these patients had obesity. They did not have diabetes, but they had obesity. And they had three arms for their study. So they had people doing an eight-hour time-restricted eating. So they were eating from noon until 8 p.m. They had people on a 25% continuous calorie restriction. So whatever their normal calorie needs were, dropped it by 25%. And it was just like an everyday eating at this new calorie target. And then they had control eaters who were able to eat whatever they wanted, and they had to eat their meals over a greater than 10-hour window. And so after one year, what they found was an average of about 5 kilogram weight loss, so 4.6 to 5.4 kilos, and an increased insulin sensitivity for the time-restricted eating group and the continuous calorie restriction group. And this is what you'll see in these longer studies. So this is a full year. You're going to actually find when it comes to weight loss, typically some sort of time-restricted eating is just as effective as a continuous calorie restriction. And that's where we'll talk about at the end of this talk how we individualize, because you kind of get similar outcomes. And most likely, this increased insulin sensitivity was related to losing an average of five kilos for those people. But for some people, time-restricted eating is really appealing, and calorie restriction, continued calorie restriction is not, and vice versa. So ultimately, we see here that either intervention worked when we compared it to control eating, where people were eating ad libitum over 10-hour period. And then here's a review study, and I liked this too because it kind of summarizes everything in one slide. So they reviewed several studies on time-restricted eating in adults and found that on average, these studies look at either a minimum of a four-hour window of eating, which is very, very, very restrictive. That'd be really hard for me. Up to a 12-hour is the max. And some people wouldn't even consider 12-hour window to really be time-restricted eating. I do think that probably, though, mimics, though, what might be more um, realistic for a lot of our patients. Most of the studies they looked at were an eight to 10 hour window of eating. And on average, people, about 85% of people in those studies were able to stick to that schedule. So it's a pretty good adherence level. And all of the positive outcomes here are listed in these green boxes. So a decreased eating window improves daily rhythms of behavior, improves circadian rhythm, 
It decreases energy intake. It can decrease body weight, fat, abdominal obesity. It can decrease fasting glucose, improve glycemic management. It can, this one says, um, increase glucose tolerance and decrease insulin resistance, can improve lipid panels, improve blood pressure, improve inflammation, atherosclerosis, and then also improve quality of life and sleep satisfaction. So there can be a ton of benefits related to this type of eating. Also, this type of eating might seem overly restricted for some people, and we can probably get similar results with other forms of diet modification. So these are the macronutrient distribution studies, and these, I think, are really, really, really interesting. This first one I'm showing you was published about 10 years ago, and it was the first one to do this type of intervention in people. Up until then, it had only been animals. These were women who had overweight and obesity and metabolic syndrome. They did not have diabetes, and they were randomized to an evening heavy versus a morning heavy meal plan for 12 weeks. There are 93 women. And what they were actually eating was really similar foods, but it was modified so that the evening heavy eaters had a 200 calorie breakfast, a 500 calorie lunch, and a 700 calorie dinner. And they had these windows, so 6 to 9 a.m. for breakfast, 12 to 3 for lunch, 6 to 9 p.m. for dinner. So this really wasn't time restricted eating because they could eat anywhere from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. It was just modifying when they were taking in the greatest amount of their nutrients. And so then on the flip side, it was the exact opposite for the breakfast heavy people. They had a 700 calorie breakfast, 500 calorie lunch, 200 calorie dinner. So it's like that whole like eat breakfast like a king, di lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. It's that idea. And what they found over that 12 week period is that even though these groups had the exact same calorie intake, it was a 1200 calorie diet, um, that the women who were eating most of their calories earlier in the day had significantly more weight loss at the end of 12 weeks than those who were on the dinner heavy eating plan. And you can see everyone did lose some weight, but there was a significant difference between the breakfast heavy and the dinner heavy groups. And then on the right hand side here, this, these first two studies are, or these first two tables are showing you glucose levels did change at the end of week 12. And again, these women did not have diabetes. They did have metabolic syndrome. Insulin levels changed, so by week 12, those heavy breakfast eaters had a significant reduction in the amount of insulin that they were secreting. And then the bottom two study, or the bottom two tables, the left one is the area under the curve of glucose, the right one is area under the curve for insulin. So it's basically just showing you with bar graphs versus scatter plots how the heavy breakfast eaters had a more significant decrease in glucose levels and insulin levels. So this was fascinating to me. Like, that's amazing that you can eat the exact same thing. You're just changing when you're eating it. And so this same group, Jakubowicz et al., they actually did this again years later, but in a population with diabetes. This was much smaller. So this was only 28 people. They have type 2 diabetes. They were on medications. They wanted to choose a variety of people with different um, intervention intensities in terms of managing their diabetes. And they were randomized to a similar idea of either three meals or six meals daily for 12 weeks, but also the three meal a day people had the heavier breakfast, lighter lunch, lightest dinner. So what you're seeing here with these little boxes, the top row are the six meals a day. So they had, and they have like percent of their daily energy intake, percent of their daily carbohydrate intake, so for the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, each of those meals provided 23% of those patients' daily carbohydrate intake, and each snack provided 10%. So we had a morning snack, mid-afternoon mid snack, and a nighttime snack. And that nighttime snack actually ended at 2300, so kind of late. So they ate up until, they could eat their last meal there until 9.30, 10 p.m., as late as 11 p.m. So their carbohydrates were very evenly distributed throughout the day. Whereas the three meal a day people, they had 50% of their daily carb intake at breakfast, 
40% at lunch, 10% at dinner. They were able to eat this from 7.30 a.m. and finish their meals around 8.30 or 9 p.m. So this actually wouldn't count as time-restricted eating, but they were modifying how much of their daily intake was happening at each eating time. And they had really marked improvements, the um, three meal a day people, in terms of their total daily insulin dosing. So these were patients who were on medications and on insulin. And what they found is that people who were eating three meals a day versus six meals a day, they decreased their daily insulin dosing by, I want to say it was like 26 or 27 units a day. It's hard to read on this graph, but it was like the high 20s. And they also lost significantly more weight than the people who were eating the, the six meals a day. The people who were eating six meals a day didn't really change their insulin intake or their body weight at all. And I, when I saw this too, I was thinking, well, of course, you lost a lot of weight, you're gonna need less insulin. They actually quote in their paper, this is from their paper, that they, and I cannot tell you at this moment exactly how they've ruled this out, but they found that the improvement of glycemic parameters was independent of the weight loss. So this wasn't actually just decreasing their daily insulin dosing because they lost weight. Patients did lose weight, but also that eating pattern was, was more significant itself in itself in terms of decreasing daily insulin dosing. So that's pretty incredible. This study looked at a combination of both like time-restricted eating and macronutrient distribution review. And what they found overall, and this is not shocking, after everything I've already shown you, it aligns with it, it kind of summarizes it, that eating at nighttime, not eating breakfast, and breakfast is always debated in the nutrition world. Is breakfast really important? Does breakfast matter that much? If you're eating a donut versus like eggs and whole wheat toast, is it worth eating breakfast at all? Like we always debate these things about breakfast, but we do know that our bodies are primed to take in calories earlier in the day and to process energy earlier in the day. So their review of all of these studies found skipping breakfast is associated with an increased risk of metabolic syndrome. Eating just one meal a day is increased, has, you have an increased risk of metabolic syndrome, doesn't matter what time of day that meal is, eating irregularly, whereas things that will decrease your risk of metabolic syndrome are eating frequent meals. How frequent is the question, right? Because I just showed you that six meals versus three meals was not better when it comes to people with diabetes, but eating frequently versus one meal a day, so eating probably two or three times a day and eating something in the morning that several studies have shown us now that these factors either increase your risk or the bottom ones here will decrease your risk of metabolic syndrome. And I also want to address medications because when we're talking about patients with diabetes, we are always concerned about the risk of hypoglycemia or ketoacidosis. So in this study, they actually reviewed several time-restricted eating studies that had been done in patients with diabetes. So they had pretty much all of the meds, metformin, sulfonylureas, TZDs, glinides, acerbose, which we rarely even use, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGL-2 inhibitors, insulin. This did not include GLP-1s. And I think that just hasn't been studied yet in this population, or at least they couldn't review that study but almost every other med class was on here. And out of all of those patients that they reviewed in those studies, there was only one hypoglycemic event reported. And it was actually a patient in the control group, not even in like the diet intervention group, on insulin. So, so far, the data that we have suggests that you can do these types of modified you know, macronutrient distribution or time-restricted eating distribution while on medications, Obviously, we'd be adjusting medications per the patient's specific plan. So what are my takeaways when we look at the meal timing research? I've shared with you some really exciting studies that have big results. There are probably many, many studies that we haven't even heard about because they're not exciting. They probably found nothing, and that's just how it is in, in research, right? What gets published is usually the more exciting studies when, when researchers find nothing doesn't always get published. So there's probably things that have happened where there was really no exciting impact from it. Most of our human studies are small and short term. The longer term studies show us that 
time-restricted eating, and in general, intermittent fasting, they're equally effective as consistent calorie reduction when it comes to weight loss. There are some differences with cardiometabolic outcomes. So that's where our people with diabetes versus people without diabetes, sometimes our people with you know, metabolic syndrome or diabetes can get an edge from these types of meal modification or time-restricted eating studies that we might not see for people who have normal metabolic health. So what do we do with all of this information? My last section here is putting it into practice. So I'm gonna give you a first scenario. This is what I would call a very typical distorted meal timing scenario. Here's a patient that's, and this is many patients I've heard over the years, but a patient that says, you know what, I don't even eat that much. In the morning I have coffee and a slice of toast. I pack a turkey sandwich for lunch, but sometimes I don't have time for it. When I get home, I have dinner with the family. The kids like ice cream for dessert, so I'll have a couple bites with them. Sometimes I have a beer or two before bed and a handful of peanuts. That's all, I'm barely even eating anything. Who's kind of heard this type of meal plan before? What are you thinking when you hear this? What are your immediate questions? You can shout it out. Where's the energy? Yeah, if you're really not eating anything at all, how do you have energy? Other questions, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, how much did you eat for dinner? I just had dinner. How many, what was your servings like? How, did you have multiple servings for dinner? What was your dinner? <laughs> you were gonna say something. I was just gonna say the nutrient timing. Yeah. That triangle sure. Right, yeah, what time is all of this happening, right? Is it like, I, I don't really eat that much at breakfast and lunch, and then I eat all of my calories at dinner and after dinner. I have a couple bites of ice cream. Like, okay, is that like a bowl of ice cream? And I'm never mocking my patients. I just think that we, especially if you don't do this for a living, we're really out of touch with how much we're eating and when we're eating it, usually. So normally, when someone tells me all of this, you know, I immediately have questions, and I'm thinking, I bet you're actually eating a lot more than you think you're eating. Um, but, like, we're gonna get into it, right? We're gonna talk through, I'll ask all of my probing questions. And for someone in this scenario, you know, after I kind of go through my normal open-ended questions, get a better picture of what that looks like, I might tell them, you know what? Some research suggests that eating more of your calories or your carbohydrates earlier in the day, or limiting your food in the evening and overnight, or having a longer break between your dinner time and your breakfast time, research tells us that these things might better align with your body's natural cycle and can help with your diabetes. Are you interested in talking about this type of eating plan? And we'll see. Like, you know, we're never gonna dictate exactly how someone's going to eat, but when I have like these distorted eating plans and right, the triangle where all of the food is on the bottom or a lack of awareness of what someone is even eating, this is how I might broach this topic and kind of get people thinking about how we can restore their meal timing based on circadian rhythm. I also see this scenario sometimes, the magic diet. My cousin started this new diet where he only eats six hours of the day and he can eat whatever he wants. He's already lost 15 pounds in two weeks. Can I do that diet with diabetes? Who's heard of the magic diet? Yeah, and it's anything. It's like keto, it's paleo, it's whatever diet. There's always a new magic diet. And whenever it comes to a new magic diet, I always wanna meet my patients where they are. So in this scenario, I'd say, wow, that sounds like your cousin's doing some form of time-restricted eating. What do you know about that type of eating? What interests you in that type of eating? And if someone decides, yeah, I do wanna do time-restricted eating, I would talk about what eating window is most realistic. Because actually, all of our research shows that if you were gonna do time-restricted eating, it is much better metabolically and circadian rhythm-wise to do it earlier in the day, like eat from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. But that is so unrealistic for most people with families because what are you gonna do at the dinner table, right? You just sit there and watch? Or what if you're the primary food preparer? So maybe the 12 to 8 window is actually much more realistic, even though if we're comparing a 12 to 8 to an 8 to 4, doesn't really match with that overall circadian meal cycling, 
but that might be what's most realistic. And so I'd ask them, like, what do you think about these windows? And how is that going to affect your family and your social dynamics? Maybe on the weekends, this person, like, goes out later in the evening. So, you know, talking through all of that. We also would definitely want to talk about medications when it comes to diabetes. Let's go through your medication list. Let's think about how your eating timing is going to affect those. And then finally, in these scenarios, I usually end up with, like, let's set a trial period. How about you try it for three weeks? I want you to write down what's really hard, what works really well, come back in and let's talk about it. I'm never a kibosher, even when there's sometimes like kind of outrageous magical diets <laughs> that people bring to me. I want to minimize risk. I'm never going to say yes, like go home and be on a juice fast for three weeks and tell me how it goes. But I do want to meet people where they are. And if someone's really excited about something, I want to like get on board with that because that way we earn some trust, we build some rapport, and we can continue working together to maybe get on what might someday be their more sustainable eating approach. And we also know that there is such a huge variety when it comes to individuals and how their bodies respond to different eating approaches, different foods. This study published several years ago was actually, I think it was a startup study for a company that now does diabetes diets based on your, meta or on your um, DNA. But what they found was they had 800 people who wore CGMs for one week. And these were people without diabetes. So they didn't even have the added factor here of what your response might be with diabetes. And they controlled what their breakfast was every day, but they could eat whatever they want for lunch. They kept really detailed records. They measured microbiome, so they actually measured fecal samples for all of these people, blood testing, they did questionnaire, they had these food diaries, and they were able to kind of create these personalized diets based on all of these factors that actually took into account those people's glycemic responses. So what's really cool is this little graph on the left-hand side, their breakfast every morning for a week was, I don't know if it was one or two slices of bread. It was just bread. It was the same bread. They like sent them this bread, so everyone was eating the same bread. And you can see, for 800 different people, this was their blood glucose levels after eating the same bread. That some people, you know, stayed in like the 100s, some people had a peak around the 130s. Some people peaked around 160 to 170. Some people peaked over 200 with their blood glucose for eating the same amount of bread. And these, again, weren't people with diabetes. So I think this is a really, really important reminder that just by looking at you, I have no idea how your body's going to respond to various foods. And our patients know themselves best because they know. Like, I've had patients, I had a patient, um, when I used to work in Seattle, who we were working on maximizing her, minimizing her glucose intake and improving her A1C as she was getting ready for metabolic and bariatric surgery, and she could not eat beans. She was like, black beans, I can't eat them. They will spike my sugar so high. Sweet potatoes don't do it. This other food doesn't do it. But like those little nuances, people know that about themselves. So that's why when people bring new ideas to be in there like I'm really excited about this I used to follow a diet like this whatever many years ago and it really worked for me I'm like let me work with you because you know your body but then ultimately we'll find a, a more sustainable path forward especially if it's a nutrition plan that might not be something that's going to work forever so my general consensus for our practical takeaways when we try to translate this meal timing research into practice in general pretty much every study is going to support Maintain a fasting period overnight and try to extend it from whatever is normal for you right now. So if I have someone who eats their last meal at 10 p.m., like, what do you think about trying to finish eating by 9 p.m. or 8 p.m.? Let's just extend that fasting window a little bit longer because we know our bodies really aren't designed to be eating in the middle of the night or late at night. Our second thing that's going to work for pretty much everyone based on our studies Eat your bigger meals earlier in the day. Because again, we can see from several studies that like getting the, that, like the majority of your carbohydrates in and your energy intake earlier in the day and weaning off as the day goes on is what works for our circadian rhythms. 
But if that doesn't work for someone, at least let's do number one. <laughs> Even if you're gonna eat the same amounts all day long, let's try to have a fasting period overnight. And then again, I just mentioned this with that case that I, we just talked about. Eating from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., that's ideal based on our circadian rhythm, but that's not realistic for everyone. So maybe a 12 to 8 p.m. window, again, for someone who wants to do time-restricted eating, it might not work as well for our circadian rhythm, but it might limit late night snacking. Does anyone eat junk food after 8 p.m.? I do. <laughs> if I had a window and I was like, I don't need any food right now, I've eaten enough, I'm not gonna eat after 8 p.m., I'm sure that would benefit my body as well. And that brings me into the last chunk here. We're gonna talk about shift work. And again, this is personal to me because this is the life I live right now. So this study I hadn't seen before until I was preparing for this talk. Because up until now, the research about how to help shift workers is all based on like what we think might be common sense, but I had not seen a study done, this type of study done, where they actually did an intervention like this. So they took 19 healthy young adults, they were all like in their mid-20s, and they had a circadian laboratory protocol. So these people actually lived in the lab so they could simulate day shift versus night shift and give them all of their meals. And the people who were working night sh or like awake for night shift in the lab, they did different variations where they fed them during the night, but also they did a variation where these people were up all night simulating working night shift, but they only ate in the daytime. And I know these graphics are like really, really small. You don't have to see them clearly to really know what's going on. But basically, the nighttime meal control group, those were the, the participants who were awake all night and they ate at night. So they completely shifted their eating times and then they slept during the day they didn't eat during the day. So they had both night eating and night work. And the consequence is circadian misalignment, right? Because like that's not normal for our brains and our bodies to be doing that. But then they did this daytime meal intervention where these participants were awake all night doing their work in the lab, but they didn't eat all night. They actually ate in the daytime. And what they found is that that maintained their homeostasis. So basically, even though their master clock, their SCN was messed up because they were awake at nighttime when it was dark out, their nutrient homeostasis, so all of those peripheral clocks in our guts, our stomachs, that was maintained. And so when they looked at the lab biomarkers for these people, like their insulin levels, their glucose levels, they were not elevated like you would expect if you're eating at night. And then this is just showing you like impaired glucose tolerance, normalized glucose tolerance. Again, they measured glucose, they measured insulin levels, they measured their temperature, and they found that these people who were working all night but only eating in the daytime were able to have normalized glucose tolerance. So if we align our fasting eating cycle still with our SCN, that can maintain our homeostasis. So their takeaway was, we can help shift workers if we tell them not to eat at nighttime and only eat during the daytime. So here's the ideal, right? And this is for a 12-hour schedule. I work 12s. Some people work 8s, right? So I would eat my dinner at 5.30 p.m. I'd go to work. I start at 7 p.m. Or maybe if you're an 8-hour person, you start at 11. I'd get off work at 7.30 a.m. I would go home, and I'd eat my breakfast and go to bed. I'd wake up and have lunch and go back to bed. And then I'd wake up at 5.30 and do it all again. So like, that's the suggestion. Here's my reality, because <laughs> when I told this, I told my colleagues, I was like, you guys, I'm doing this talk in Alaska. I found this study. What do you think about this? And they were like, what? <laughs> there are some expletives I won't share here. Because the reality is, this is what it feels like to work night shift, and those of you who have done it know it. 6 p.m., I groggily wake up. I drink a mug of tea. I get to work at 7 p.m. Overnight, maybe I get to eat the food I packed. Maybe I didn't pack food. Maybe I eat junk food if it's out. If I'm lucky, because also I'm running between, I'm a labor and delivery nurse. So I'm running between births and stat C-sections and postpartum hemorrhages. At 7.30 a.m., I can clock out. I get home. I go to bed as soon as I get home. I don't want to eat at that point. I sleep really crummy. I'm not a good daytime sleeper. At 1 p.m., I actually wake up at 10 a.m. and have to pee every morning. But let's pretend I could sleep until 1 p.m. 
I'd go to the bathroom, I would eat a handful of Cheddar Jack Cheez-Its, and I'd go back to bed and sleep really crummy. And then I wake up at six and sometimes I cry <laughs> because I have to go back to work and I'm so tired. And so like the reality of doing this intervention is just, I, I appreciated reading it and what I've tried my last few night shift works, or my night shifts, the last one I had on Monday night coming into yesterday, I didn't eat from 10 p.m. until 6.30 a.m. And that was like, okay, I maintained an overnight fast. And really it's because I was working all night with a first time mom who ended up with a non-planned C-section. So I was too busy to eat, but I guess that helped me not to eat. But so what I would say for your shift workers is individualized recommendations. We know what the research said would be ideal for maintaining our normal homeostasis. But really, I'm gonna tell my patients, sleep as much as you can. Don't wake up in the middle of the day to eat if you can sleep all day. And try to have an overnight fast. Maybe you're so busy you don't have time to eat. But make sure you stay hydrated, right? Bring like water, bring your tea or your coffee. Ideally, it doesn't have added sugars in it, but it might because whatever you need to do to get through the night, we get it. If you're gonna pack some food, maybe it's protein-based snacks. We can at least be healthful if we have a chance to eat. Eat a light breakfast when you get home, if it's comfortable for you. I don't like to eat right before I go to bed, but if that helps you, that kind of would get you back on the idea of daytime eating again. Have your dinner at home if you can, because you'll actually maybe be able to sit and eat it and not be in your you know, crazy work situation. So we do what we can, but we always have to be realistic and reminding our patients to be kind to themselves because shift work is really hard and our bodies are messed up all of the time. So my few takeaways and then we'll have some time for questions. What we know overall is these meal timing interventions, they're rarely harmful and many of them are beneficial. So be open to new strategies, be open to new ideas with your patients or ideas your patients bring to you. Because someday we're gonna have the science where we do a blood test and we're like, I know exactly what nutrition plan works for you. We don't have all of that research yet, but someday we will. And be flexible, so if someone wants to try something or we're gonna modify something, like let's try to limit eating overnight for shift work, but also let's be flexible with what you need to do to get through your work and still be functional. It's never all or nothing. And then also I strongly encourage you, test it out. If you've never done time-restricted eating, try it for a few days. It's helpful to know especially if you have patients bringing these ideas to you or you get to see how that works for you and your body, it's always helpful to have some firsthand experience as well. So thank you very much. And we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so I live up in Nome, Alaska, and in the winter time, mm -hmm. we have darkness for 20 hours a day. Yeah. And in the summertime, we have light for 20 hours a day. So how does, does it have to do with the daylight or does it have to do with the timing? So like if I wanted to eat from like 8 a.m. till um, 4 p.m., then it would not be light all that time, it would be dark. So does yeah. that have anything to do with the circadian rhythm? Yeah, it definitely does. And I thought about that doing this talk here where we have like such a range. I haven't seen a study specifically done in people who live in areas where you get that big of a shift between summer to winter. What I would say is like you definitely, even during the period when we have what, like four or five hours of daylight, that you ideally want to eat during that time because it does depend on the daylight, but also because you go back into periods of more daylight, a lot of the research says that we tend to kind of still keep this primary pattern in our bodies. So I would assume that your circadian clock doesn't change too much throughout the year because you have a period where you're right in that clock, you have a period with very little daylight, a period with a lot of daylight. 
So maybe you would shift it a little bit for the winter or the summer, but ideally trying to maintain more, assuming that your body still has a relatively, no, I'll say normal, but like average circadian clock. But it's interesting, I haven't seen research. Has anyone seen research on that? I know we have someone doing a sleep talk this afternoon and I don't know if they might have that, but, but yeah, that's really interesting. I also think about the Mediterranean style of eating and how in a lot of European countries they eat really late at night and why doesn't that impact them? And truthfully, it's probably partially because what they're eating late at night, at least traditionally, was more wholesome. It's not, you know, my handful of Cheez-Its in the middle of the night. It's like protein or vegetables. Um, it's usually a light meal. But yeah, like there are shifts in terms of culture and environment that would impact overall circadian rhythm. But I think I would try to plan, if you were going to try to eat around this, planning that your circadian rhythm is somewhat average for most of the year. Yeah. And also I will say, even if your master clock is kind of thrown off by the daylight and day ni or nighttime, your peripheral clock you can still keep on that rhythm because your peripheral clock can sometimes work independently of your master clock. So that would be the other reason to try to maintain a more consistent way of eating throughout the year, even when the daylight is changing. For some folks in Alaska, and definitely in other northern latitudes, I've heard of people using sun lamps, like for yeah. emotional health and wellness. Um, do you, uh, did you come across that in any of your research about mm -hmm. how sun lamps might help or affect circadian rhythm at all? Yeah, they do help. Um, I've done a talk like this, but focused also on the sleep side as well, which I didn't include as much today, I focused on meals. But yeah, sun lamps are another really helpful way, especially to wake up. It's encouraged for shift workers, like when you're waking up and soon in Minnesota, it will be dark at 7 p.m. So I'll be waking up in the dark, leaving work in the dark. Mm -hmm. And so I have a sun lamp from when I lived in Seattle as well, since it's a relatively gray place. But yeah, the, the lamps as well, doing it's usually only about 20 minutes. You don't stare directly into them. You can kind of look away or close your eyes. But that does mimic daylight for your body. So not only can it affect mood, but that could also help you to kind of get on the rhythm that you need to have, like if you're trying to wake up for your shift or you want to have daylight in the morning when you're eating. So yeah, thank you. Actually, I was going to mention that, so thank you for reminding me. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Seth, primary care dietitian. Um, I was thinking about your cases, and some of them f match pretty well with what I see in clinic. Um, but it's not necessarily out of like busyness. It's like I, I don't. I, I know breakfast is good for me, but mm -hmm. I'm nauseous in the morning, or I don't feel hungry. I'm curious on how you would approach that kind of scenario. Yeah, that, I see that a lot when someone's so used to eating late at night too and they wake up and they're not hungry because their body's like, we just ate, we don't need something. And so usually for that, it's kind of a combo of trying to bump that evening meal a little bit earlier or that evening meal or snacking, make it a little bit lighter and then starting with the idea of breakfast and maybe it's just really simple and really light. Sometimes like some of my patients like to do like, a little bit of protein powder in their coffee and that's their breakfast like they're getting some nutrition in them or maybe it's you know I don't know a string cheese or a yogurt or whatever is appealing but just a I would start really small and something that doesn't the idea of it doesn't nauseate them but I think by working on both ends so bumping that dinner time earlier and making that lighter and slowly introducing some nutrition in the morning that after a week or two, I've seen that people kind of shift into eating and that becomes their new pattern. But it's hard, like if you've been eating that way for years and years, you're not gonna change it all overnight. So it's kind of like little shifts on either end to get back into what would be a non-distorted meal timing. Yes, 
one and then two. So clearly the time-restricted feeding has sort of uh, benefits. I suppose, has any studies been done to be able to sort of separate in terms of the time of day you're consuming the meals versus the effects in terms of the total calories that you're consuming? Because a lot of evidence suggests is that essentially by restricting the time that you're eating, you're basically eliminating the snacking that you know, someone mm -hmm. may typically occur and so are consuming less calories overall. Yeah, I think it's a combination because when you compare like the time restricted eating to continuous calorie restriction, you see about the same results in weight loss, suggesting that people are eating less when their windows are decreased. But then also I think it's partially the timing too, especially like that study that showed people eat the exact same amount of calories, but increasing the bulk of it earlier in the day, that that also has a positive impact. So I think it can be both. I, I'm sure there are scenarios which we didn't see in these studies where someone does time-restricted eating but eats so, so much during that window, I would imagine you're really not going to see any weight loss improvement, but maybe you would still see some kind of glucose improvement or insulin resistance improvement as well. So I haven't seen that exact scenario in research, but based on the studies we have seen, that would be my thought. Um, hi, this is a great presentation, thank you. Um, my question has to do with, I grew up eating small breakfast, big lunch, small dinner, and I didn't see that scenario up there. Mm -hmm. Maybe for those people who, and I am the same way, don't have much appetite in the morning, maybe that's the solution, it's still shifted earlier? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that could still work. Yeah, I haven't seen that in a study, so it'd be like, what is the opposite of an hourglass? <laughs> it's like a diamond-shaped eating plan. But yeah, as long as you're still getting the majority of your nutrition in earlier in the day, really around 3 to 4 p.m. is when we become much more insulin resistant than we were in the morning. So if you're getting the bulk of your calories in before mid-afternoon or your carbs for thinking diabetes and then having a smaller dinner still, I think that could work well also. And you're right, that would be a another way to customize it for someone that's not really a big breakfast person. So yeah, thank you for that suggestion. I think we have just like a minute or so left. So any last questions or also we can have lunch. <laughs> we, can, we gotta get our calories and carbs in in the next few hours, guys. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>